Uh, we're not going to spend about 15 minutes um, answering questions from uh, the talks that uh, Ali and Eric gave. Um, we'd love to get questions from the audience. Please uh, send them in now so we can answer as many as possible. But before we begin, that, I'd like to introduce my co-chair, Dr. Sasu Takoma. Uh, Dr. Takoma is a professor and head of the Department of Computer Science at the University of Helsinki in Finland. Over his career, he's published over 240 scientific publications and has 10 U.S. patents. In recent months, he and his colleagues have been working on investigating contact networks and mobility patterns, as well as smartphone and cellular network data to better understand and predict stages of the pandemic. He and his colleagues recently published a commentary in The Lancet focusing on the future prospect of data fusion and multi-scaling modeling, as well as the need for new technologies that can improve data privacy. Uh, Sasu, what do you think about uh, what you heard this morning so far? So I think the presentations have been really great. So this is a very important topic and it's really great to participate uh, in the event. And thank you for the introduction. Also a warm welcome from my side as well for this session. Great, so we're getting our uh, questions for your WhatsApp. I'm gonna take prerogative and ask uh, the first question for both our speakers. You both mentioned seasonality in your new predictive models. Can you talk a little bit about the impact you're seeing of seasonality and if that impact is due to the biology, the virus or changes in human behavior? I, I can say a little bit about what we've done on that. Um, uh, so, um, and, and please interrupt me uh, if you if you want to chime in. Uh, so, so we have looked for a correlation between uh, growth rates and and, and cl uh, climate variables. Uh, so, things like humidity and temperature from month to month, and we've seen virtually nothing. Uh, other groups have also looked at this uh, at different scales, both globally, um, and uh, I think we have a lot of, of excellent data from China now. So, um, you know, within the epidemic in China, uh, which had tens of thousands of cases, we have uh, a very big range of environments um, in terms of temperature and humidity. Um, and, and so this also didn't find any correlation between these variables and growth rates. Um, I, I think seasonality might become a much more important um, variable going into the autumn, and, and that's for, um, uh, again, behavioral reasons. So I mean, what we have is, is, is a new virus. It's a very competent virus. It can be transmitted very easily. It, it doesn't apparently uh, matter very much if you're in a hot, humid environment or, or a dry, cold environment, uh, which we know can matter with other viruses. Um, but what will definitely matter is density of human contact. And, and so we know that tends to increase um, uh, with opening of schools and, and in winter months uh, when people spend more time indoors. So we have looked at the temperature and the, in our data, the relation between temperature and infections. And early on, it was a very weak uh, association between uh, temperature for each one Celsius uh, increase. There was less than 2% decline in transmission. It was holding early on in the United States, but uh, and everywhere in the world. But when you start adding what's really going against seasonality, so it was supposed to come down in the United States because the weather was getting warmer. But increase in mobility happened at the same time. People started stop wearing their masks and started, you know, we opened our bars and we've seen what happens here in Memorial Day. So that overwhelmed the effect of temperature. But in our models right now, when we saw seasonality from more, it's a very strong association with infection rate that we find in our model. So it's in our data. We keep seasonality for pneumonia uh, in our model as uh, one of the covariate in our projection, and there is a strong association between pneumonia and pneumonia. If you know, if you in the United States, for example, it never goes to zero. Where like the flu comes down very low and starts picking up in the fall, pneumonia doesn't go down all the way to zero. So that's what we're noticing right now. Adjusting for mobility, mask wearing, distancing, and all the other variables still is a strong effect. Sasu, you want to ask a question? Uh, yes, so I have uh, one question uh, for both uh, speakers. So it's about uh, the impact of AI techniques for predictive modeling. 
So uh, as we know, the AI field is evolving very fast, and we are, for example, deep learning methods that can help in finding new insights from the data. So how do you see the role of AI solutions in the predictive modeling of pandemics? So Dr. Waltz and Dr. Mogdad, please. Um, I, I think AI definitely has a role to play, but um, I mean, the fact is it hasn't played a very prominent role in, in most of the modeling efforts, um, at least in the first few months. And um, I, I mean, I think that's that's both a function of, of the difficulty of the problem and dealing with many uh, different uh, types of data, uh, um, which you know need to be prepared and cleaned in, in various ways before they become useful, and, and also um, um, a consequence of the fact that. Um, uh, we already have fairly good statistical models that have been developed over decades, um, and um, um, and you know again when we're we're mostly dealing with traditional epidemiology data sources like new infections and deaths, um, there's there's not a, a great deal of, of new insight uh, you can bring in with with uh, machine learning or or a AI methods um, unless you have uh, some some other new additional data source. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't say it's, it's played a very prominent role in, in predictions um, so far, but uh, again, uh, now going forward uh, over the first wave, the situation is much more complex and we've had more time to prepare. So I think, I think it may have a, a bigger role going forward. We don't use AI in our modeling here. And uh, what, we are, what we spend a lot of time on is really prepping and cleaning the data and making sense of the data before we put it in our models. And uh, I don't see a big role for AI at this stage for this model. We need a lot of data set to inform AI in order to do better prediction. And we, you know, this is a new virus. Great, thank you. First question from the audience. Um, is the pandemic affecting the rate of other communicable diseases? I think Ali mentioned a little bit about it. Do we see any changes in other communicable diseases? Yes, so uh, unfortunately, you know, we have, uh, even with the lockdown and the virus, we're having a lot of impact on other diseases, non-communicable and communicable diseases. And uh, that's bigger of a, more of a concern in uh, low-income country and low-middle-income countries where there is a delay of HIV treatment, immunization, and so on. And of course, the economy and the lockdown for many countries in the world where they make their earning for that day, working that day, they don't have reserve. Malnutrition, if you take a country like Egypt or Pakistan and the region where they were facing a stunting problem or malnutrition or overnutrition, that would be even more of a problem. What we're seeing also, uh, last point, and I'll let the other speaker uh, add, uh, what we are seeing right now, some reports uh, from South America where we see less flu. So there are some positive uh, impact on some other uh, infectious diseases where people, because of their behavior and they're staying indoor, wearing a mask, washing their hands, there is less of a flu uh, in South America. And our concern in the United States was like the second phase that's coming ahead will coincide with all the respiratory diseases of uh, fall and winter. Uh, we don't see it as big right now in many parts in South America and Argentina and Chile because people are, you know, staying away from each other and that way we see less flu circulating at that time. Over. Yeah, I, I agree with all of that as well and I'd also add a, a point about uh, the impact on on infectious diseases that spread uh, in a similar way uh, by by droplet aerosol uh, as, as SARS-CoV-2. So um, we, we've seen a big impact on influenza across the board. Um, I'd also throw in Australia as another place where um, the flu epidemic is basically not taken off uh, during its traditional season. Um, you know, but th there there have also been some other impacts I've seen on on um, uh, diseases that have a very different transmission route. So, uh, uh, especially in, in March and April during the, the lockdown, there was a lot of excitement among the HIV prevention community um, because uh, they, they saw this as an opportunity to, to actually prevent many transmissions uh, because uh, uh, they, they think that many transmissions happen during the first few months of infection. And if you can essentially prevent people from uh, coming into uh, close contact for several months, that, sh that should be able to interrupt a lot of HIV transmission chains as well. Great. The next question from the audience is, um, what is your view on herd immunity? Um, how, 
how many people will have to be infected to get it? And is it, are you, do you account for that at all in your models? So we do account for how many people are infected. So uh, in a way in our model, because we estimate that and it's a covariant that goes in our projection. So let me talk about, you see me smiling, there is nothing to smile about when it comes to COVID-19. Herd immunity, in my opinion, it's something we use in epidemiology for a vaccine, not for an infection. And for me, when we start talking about herd immunity in our community, it's basically we admit failure and let the virus circulate among ourselves. And I don't think any of us is saying that. Uh, herd immunity will be very costly. If you take the surveys that we have right now in the United States and elsewhere, so take New York City, for example, antibody surveys show 21% antibodies positive. Look how many people died in uh, New York City in order to reach that level. So if to go to 40, 60, 70, or 80, uh, how many people will, are gonna die from that? So what we're seeing right now, there is a lot of theories about a lower uh, effect of a lower level of herd immunity, but let me explain that. And I'm sorry for taking so much time because this is something very important. We're seeing a herd immunity. People are saying there is a herd immunity at a level of 20 and 30 percent infection in certain locations. Let me explain why the danger of that. Uh, in parts of Asia right now, because there are other infections from uh, coronaviruses, there is some T cell recognition and there is more defense of the virus because uh, attacking the COVID-19 as a recognition from pre previous exposure to cor uh, coronaviruses. But when it comes to a low herd immunity in some countries, like now in Pakistan, COVID-19 comes into a geographic location and starts spreading in a country. Started in Wuhan, spread all the way in China. When you're looking at Wuhan when it happened, or in Beirut when it entered Beirut, there is a circle of individuals. Some of them, unfortunately, due to harvesting effect, will die. And some of the key spreader, like the guy who's in the pharmacy or in the store, gets infected. So even at a lower infection rate, the circulation drops down a little bit in that locality. Then it's spread to another circle and it goes all over again. So it's a full sense of security when people tell you right now that we see herd immunity at 20 and 30%. My response to that is wait a little bit. You've seen it in that location because of people who died and people who are infected, what we call a super spreader. But once it moves outside that circle, it's gonna spread all over again. We've seen it in every part of the world. We've seen it in Iran when they picked up in April, it came down for a long time, nothing happened. And the Iranian felt, oh, we don't have a problem. We've seen it in Florida. So herd immunity is very concerning for me when people talk about it over. Eric, do you have any thought on it? Yeah, I would echo, echo your concerns about uh, uh, generating a, a false sense of security um, by by arguing for for lower levels of, of herd immunity. Um, that this is actually a somewhat controversial topic. I mean, not not just in, in the political sphere, but uh, among um, uh, um, uh, mathematical epidemiologists as well. There there are uh, well reasoned um, models developed by uh, good scientists that have suggested that uh, herd, herd immunity levels could be lower than would be suggested in, in a lot of um, traditional models that have uh, very homogeneous rates of, of uh, transmission and, and homogeneous susceptibility. Um, and that may well be the case to some extent. But, but the problem with this is that it's not something that we can predict very well. It's not something that um, we can measure until well after the fact. Uh, so uh, it, it's not something that we should assume will uh, work in our favor in the future. I, I, again, um, I mean, I, I completely agree with the, the previous comments that I mean, we should assume that a very large proportion of infection is required for herd immunity um, and, and not count on, on 20 or 30% being adequate. Great. Another question from the audience, um, with a false kit, Forecasting done on a national level in a large country such as India, China, or Indonesia result in skewed data since the transmission of virus in the different cities might be dynamic depending on resources and population density. Very true. We do projections and uh, we haven't released it in India at the state level, in Indonesia at the province level. We're doing in the United States, as I showed you at the state level, and now we're moving to do it at the county level. And yes, there is a total difference for several reasons. One of it is behavior change 
due to the infection rate. But in the United States, I'll give you the example, that holds true in Indonesia and in India. In the United States, we have a state and we have a county within the state. Some counties have a mandate for masks and there are people wearing a much more higher rate of masks. If you do the whole state, you're averaging. If you take Florida, Miami had always a mandate for masks, had a lockdown before the rest of the state. So you get a false picture of the whole state unless you go down to a smaller locality. Uh, we do projections at the local level in Brazil. If you look at our data in Mexico, wherever we have that data, we do it at a smaller level at the state level. But a very good point, and you're right. Eric, anything to add? Um, uh, briefly, so, so um, you know, one of the reasons, uh, again, that, that death time series have, have been um, the most widely used, uh, and it's, it's most easily comparable between countries and over time. So we have huge changes over time in, in, in testing rates. Um, also, big differences in sensitivity of tests, um, and and um, uh, and it, and. It becomes so much the the harder if we're actually trying to compare uh, regions with very different testing behaviors. Um, so, um, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I uh, one strength of alternative data sources like like genetic data in particular is that it's it's actually very robust to biased sampling. So, um, you know, if we have a good random sample of genetic data from um, a location, it's largely immune to these problems of of uh, different testing rates. Um, um, or different testing rates through time. Can I say something about testing, which is very important? Early on in the US and in many places, testing was strongly associated associated with a reduction in cases because you were able to remove these cases, isolate them, and you were able to do contact tracing, testing the contacts, isolate them, identify them first. Right now, with the testing in the United States uh, that has increased rapidly and in many places in the world, even some parts of the Gulf, that exceeds the capacity of the public health system to do trace. And because you increase your testing in many places in the US and others, there is a delay in giving the results, sometimes in the US three to four days, which makes tracing obsolete. I mean, you can't do it and your public health system is overwhelmed. You take a state like uh, Florida, again, 15,000 cases a day at one point of time, 12,000 before, 10 before. There is no way a public health system could do the tracing. So right now in our data, as testing is increasing, we're seeing a less impact of testing on the projections and the declining of infections. So there is a comfort zone where a government or a locality can do testing do it right and do the tracing. Above and beyond that is for treatment purposes, not for a public health and controlling the pandemic, unfortunately. Over. Great. So here's an important question. Uh, based on your data, how long will the pandemic last? Well, we're, we're not really on a path to medication. <laughs> We are doing a projections uh, all the way right now to the end of 2021. Uh, we haven't released it, but we've been asked to do it and we have presented it to some authorities here in the US and elsewhere. It's gonna be with us for a long time until we have an effective vaccine or an effective drug that will change everything we are doing. Sorry, over. Right. I, I would also say that we're, we're probably not going to be able to eradicate this virus, even if there is a, an effective vaccine. Um, and I mean, we've, I mean we, we certainly can't uh, eradicate influenza dis, despite having at least a, a decent partially effective vaccine. And um, I mean, certainly this is uh, on the same order of difficulty as seasonal influenza. So I, I think we should probably, uh, the baseline scenario is we have something like what happened in 1918, where we have a virus that uh, continually adapts and we see uh, changing its form and, and generating new variants going forward. And the concern we have is many people right now are saying they will not take the vaccine. It's something that we need to spend time on and do a lot of education right now about the importance of this vaccine. So, uh, Eric and Ali, I'd like to thank you for uh, for your time today, um, informing uh, uh, our audience about uh, both the models and getting your advice. It was great and really appreciated. So, so I'll let you, you. wrap up and, and give me your thoughts of what we heard this morning today. Thank you. So, uh, thank you to the speakers. So, really excellent presentations, and uh, and I believe uh, today. So, so, uh, so we heard about. Uh, how the toolkit for predictive modeling is evolving. 
And uh, I think it's evolving fast based on what we heard. So there are good techniques that have been extensively used in predicting the different stages of the COVID-19 pandemic. And then we have these newer directions, for example, longer term predictions and, and uh, using these uh, different uh, uh, data sources, for example, smartphone data and so on, to support uh, the analysis. So, uh, so this toolkit is really, uh, uh, it's evolving. And I think that's a good, uh, good thing for our communities and, uh, and helps uh, to then support evidence-based decisions for uh, detecting and mi mitigating pandemics. So, um, so these developments contribute to the world health security. And I think uh, uh, these are uh, my thoughts from this uh, session today and really excellent discussion. Oh, I, I agree. I would also take away that both speakers talked about how robust the models are in the short term and how the confidence of the predictions long term is, is not as great because of the variables that they discuss, such as different government policies, changes in physical distancing, masking that go along with um, uh, rise of changes in, in the prevalence. and. Uh, and this idea that we're going to reestat um, our social distancing over time, and that will affect the spread of the virus, I think was uh, what we heard from both speakers, and, and I agree with that. So, again, uh, Sasu, thanks for being with me uh, today. We appreciate it. And again, thank the speakers and the audience for participating today. We really appreciate it. Thank you.